start with the last session for today, which will be about system improvements. And our first speaker for today is Sören Tempel. Um, he is a PhD student in the group of computer architecture in the University of Bremen. Um, he, his, primary, his primary research interests uh, are the verification of embedded software using symbolic execution and virtual prototypes. And um, that will be also a topic for of his talk. So uh, yeah, give a warm welcome to Sören. Okay, hi, thanks everyone. Um, I'm Sören Tempel. I'm a PhD student at the University of Bremen. And today I would like to present our work on automated testing of Riot modules using ZimXVP. And I would like to, uh, the presenter doesn't work anymore. And the next and previous button also do not work anymore. <laughs> Yeah, that might be the case. I know it works. Okay. Uh, so as I said, I would like to present our work on automated testing of write modules using ZimXVP. And I would like to start off with a brief motivation. Um, our work is largely motivated by the fact that uh, many IoT operating systems including Riot, have relatively few um, runtime mitigations for common programming errors, such as buffer overflows, especially compared to conventional operating systems like Linux. And since many of these programming errors, especially buffer overflows, are exploitable, uh, the goal of our research work is to discover these, sort of, these sorts of errors prior to the uh, deployment of an embedded IoT device in a production environment. And a promising technique to um, discover these sorts of bugs is uh, automated software testing. And I would briefly like to uh, mention a few um, software testing techniques, which you might have heard of already. A very prominent one is uh, static analysis, where the uh, program is analyzed statically, so it is not executed. And for this reason, it is relatively easy to employ static analysis on a given code base. However, the uh, problem with static analysis is that the analysis can, of course, uh, yield false positives. And that can at times uh, make it difficult to interpret the results of a performed static analysis, since you always have to keep in mind that a bug might just be a false positive. A uh, different technique, uh, which has gained some traction over the past few years, and which contrary to fuzzing is a dynamic testing technique, which means it actually executes the uh, tested software, is fuzzing. I'm sure many of you have already heard of fuzzing, but for those who haven't heard of it so far, fuzzing um, executes the program or the software you are testing with uh, randomly generated input values. And the idea is basically that the program should be able to handle any arbitrary input. And the fuzzer does, uh, runs the program with a randomly generated input value and checks if it crashes on this input or inhibits any other kind of uh, unintended behavior. However, um, the problem with fuzzing is it doesn't actually perform any formal reasoning and just relies on random input generation. And for this reason, um, fuzzing is often incapable of satisfying complex input constraints. So for example, if you have a part of your code is buggy and this particularly buggy code can only be reached with a certain input value, then a fuzzer might not be able to generate an input which triggers this buggy code and then you might miss bugs in your code. And a, a different technique, which is similar to fuzzing and has gained uh, some popularity, at least in the academic sector, is uh, symbolic execution. And similar to fuzzing, symbolic execution is also a dynamic testing technique, which means it actually executes the tested software. But um, symbolic execution <laughs> actually uh, performs, contrary to fuzzing, performs uh, formal reasoning. So the idea of symbolic execution is similar to the idea of fuzzing. We want to enumerate uh, execution paths through a given program based on a specific input source. And contrary to fuzzing, um, symbolic execution executes the software not with concrete input values, but instead with symbolic input values. And these symbolic input values always refer to a set of possible concrete values. And for this reason, they're often represented as uh, mathematical formulas. So for example, the uh, formula a greater five and a smaller 10 would refer to all the concrete values between five and 10. And these sets of uh, concrete values, these symbolic values, are uh, continuously constrained during program execution to match uh, the constraints that the program is enforcing upon the inputs. And what this allows us to do is, it allows us to do formal reasoning on branch conditions. So if we have an if statement that depends on a symbolic value, we can then use an SMT solver to check uh, 
with both the true and the false branch of the if statement under the current constraints uh, are reachable. And this allows us to maximize branch coverage. And if we apply this technique to every branch we encounter, then we can uh, simultaneously explore the true and the false branch and maximize branch coverage. And we can also use our SMT solver to um, solve our symbolic expressions, our symbolic values, when we encounter a bug, for example. So if we run into a bug during our testing, then we can use our um, SMT solver and convert the symbolic expression to a concrete value. And we can then use this concrete value to do further debugging or to create a bug report in the uh, right issue tracker with a um, buggy input that we found in some write module. And as I said, symbolic execution has already gained some traction in the academic domain. A popular tool in this regard is CLI, uh, which is a symbolic execution engine that symbolically executes LLVMER, the um, intermediate language used by the LLVM compiler infrastructure. Another tool that is also somewhat popular is Anger, which is a Python framework for software analysis using symbolic execution. However, the majority of these existing symbolic execution frameworks focus more on the conventional desktop domain. So for example, they test uh, Linux applications. And uh, the goal of our research is to employ symbolic execution for testing uh, IoT software. And if you apply uh, symbolic execution in the IoT domain, as I said, the majority of work focuses like on x68 desktop systems, then there are several challenges that need to be addressed in order to use it successfully. So first of all, one major difference between the conventional desktop domain and the um, low-level embedded IoT domain is that embedded software often uses a variety of different peripherals and interacts with these peripherals on a very low abstraction level. And uh, furthermore, in general, like embedded software depends much more on these low-level machine details. For example, inline assembly is something you encounter very often in embedded software. And if you operate in a higher abstraction level, like Klee, for example, which executes LLVMER, then you're not able to execute code with inline assembly directly because you have to lift it to LLVMER in order to be able to execute it. And in order to address these challenges, um, we lever a technique from prior work, which is called uh, virtual prototypes. And virtual prototypes are widely used in both academia and industry and are basically an executable software model of a given hardware platform. So they allow you to execute or simulate software for a given hardware platform in a um, simulated environment. And um, they also, since they model the entirety of the targeted hardware platform, they uh, also include models for the uh, peripherals provided by the hardware platform. So for example, UR peripherals or sensor peripherals. And these uh, peripherals are commonly um, described in a hardware modeling language called system CTLM. And system CTLM describes peripherals on a very high abstraction level based on a bus abstraction and how um, peripherals communicate over this bus. And uh, it is based on the uh, C++ programming language. Basically, it is a class library for the C++ programming language, which extends C++ with facilities for modeling hardware. And as I said, it is widely used, uh, this concept is widely used in academia and industry. And uh, we leverage an existing virtual prototype for the uh, RISC-V architecture for our work. And this uh, virtual prototype is called uh, RISC-V PP and offers an executable software model for a variety of uh, RISC-V based hardware platforms. Most importantly, the um, SI5551, which is a 32-bit RISC-V microcontroller, which is also uh, supported by Riot, as many of you may know. And what uh, RISC-V PP allows us to do, it allows us to do concrete execution of any kind of software, which is targeting this particular a microcontroller, so including uh, Riot software. And uh, RISC-V-PP is entirely open source and available on GitHub. However, the problem with RISC-V-PP is it only does concrete software execution. And as I motivated in the beginning, we of course want to test software and therefore we need to do symbolic execution. And uh, for this reason, we propose ZimXVP. And ZimXVP is essentially a combination of symbolic execution, the testing technique, and uh, virtual prototypes. And it integrates this uh, existing open source risc PP with the uh, CLI symbolic execution engine I mentioned in the beginning. Uh, however, contrary to CLI, it does not execute LLVMER since this would not allow us to handle inline assembly. And instead it executes um, risc V machine code directly um, based on symbolic values. So for, instance, for example, um, symbolic reg register or memory values. And um, ZimXVP is also very tightly integrated with the uh, system C uh, modeling language I mentioned earlier. So as I said, system C models peripheral behavior based on a bus abstraction. And for this reason, the central component of our architecture is the system CTLM bus. Uh, 
and we have uh, several components attached to this bus. So for example, if we uh, have a sense peripheral or a UART as we do on the SLI551, then this UART is attached to the system CTLM bus. And uh, ZimXVP is written in a way that it allows us to transport symbolic values over this TLM hardware bus abstraction through a TLM extension mechanism. And what we can do is if the software accesses uh, a register in the UART, for example, if it reads the data register of the UART, then we can modify our system C model of the UART in a way that it returns symbolic values to the software. And uh, these symbolic values would be transported over the TLM bus and the memory interface to the executed software. And the software would then be explored based on these test inputs returned by our UART model. So essentially the idea behind ZimXVP is um, that we can explore embedded software based on peripheral inputs. And uh, we can utilize this technique to test uh, various um, write applications. And one interesting target in this regard is uh, GNRC, because as you all know, GNRC is of course a very complex piece of software with a lot of uh, code implementing different protocols. And um, we test GNRC by uh, using this technique I described earlier by injecting um, inputs, test inputs through peripherals. And for testing GNRC, we um, of course inject our test inputs through a network peripheral. Now, the uh, problem with testing GNRC um, dynamic testing techniques like symbolic execution is that you, of course, have a very large uh, program state space. So there's a lot of protocol implementations and you cannot test everything at once since it's simply too much state space. So uh, in order to mitigate this problem, we employ the Vite and Conquer, where we test individual pro protocol implementations uh, separately. And uh, since we inject um, our test inputs at the um, network peripheral level, we do so by treating the lower layer network protocols like the IPv6 header or the UDP header as concrete values. And then we only use uh, symbolic values for the actual protocol implementation that we want to test. So if we want to test a MQTT implementation, for example, or an MQTT SM implementation, then we would treat the IPv6 header as concrete, the UDP header as concrete, and then we would have a, a symbolic UDP payload. And um, basically, um, <clears throat> oops. Uh, basically, the symbolic values are in injected through a, a UART, which is provided by the SI5551, and then interpreted as uh, slip frames uh, by Riot to transport um, IP datagrams over the uh, UART. And since the lower layers are concrete, the IPv6 implementation, for example, or the UDP implementation would simply forward these bytes, and they would ultimately end up in a library or an application that we are targeting, like an MQTT NSN implementation, for example. And this implementation would then be explored based on the uh, symbolic values contained in the uh, UDP payload. And the advantage of this approach, injecting these test inputs at the peripheral level, is that the integration effort is minimal because we don't have to write any kind of test harness. We can just take an existing application, inject our inputs through peripheral, and then test it. The only change you have to make in this regard is that you have to configure your GNSC application to, to use a slip network peripheral. Um, there's also an alternative direction we experimented with uh, where we tested um, individual functions of write modules. This is especially useful if you want to test a, a write utility module, for example. Uh, contrary to the approach I presented on the previous slide, this requires some manual effort because you have to create a test harness, but it allows for more fine-grained tests of individual functions um, with the, the, the uh, drawback that you have some uh, manual effort. And these test harnesses uh, pretty much look like this. This is a small, simple test harness for the URI parser module. And the central function of the URI parser module is the uh, URI parser process function, which is invoked in line 13. And since we want to explore this function and explore possible execution paths through this function, uh, we pass a buffer to it, which is uh, allocated in line eight. And this buffer is filled with symbolic values in line 12 through a custom utility function, which is called VP makes symbolic. And what VP makes symbolic does is it is given a buffer and a length, and it then fills this buffer with the uh, given amount of symbolic bytes. And we would then explore possible execution paths through this UI parser process function. And um, what both of these approaches give us is that we can enumerate reachable paths through Riot software, either by injecting inputs through the peripheral or by manually writing a test harness for certain functions of Riot utility modules. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, our research is largely motivated by the detection of programming errors. And so to do that, we also need an error model. We need to define what kind of errors we want to detect on each path, and then we need to check each executed path for such an error condition. And um, the focus of our work in this regard is the lack of memory safety in the C programming language. Um, 
And there are actually two aspects to memory safety. The first one is temporal safety, which is ensured when memory is never used after it's freed. And the second aspect, um, which is in my opinion more crucial for the embedded domain, is uh, spatial safety, which is ensured when any pointer dereference is always within the memory allocated to that pointer. And um, when you're testing conventional Linux software, for example, you can often use existing development tools like Volgrind, for example, which many of you have probably used, or address sanitizer to uh, test the software for violation of spatial or temporal safety guarantees. But uh, these tools target um, conventional Linux systems primarily. So we cannot use Volgrind and we cannot use address sanitizer for ZimXVP since we execute embedded RISC-V software and this is not supported by Volgrind or address sanitizer. So instead, uh, we leverage prior work on hardbound, and hardbound achieves uh, spatial hardware, uh, spatial safety through um, bounded pointers in hardware, or in our case, in the uh, virtual prototype that we have created. And hardbound um, relies on the software to communicate the initial pointer points, pointer points uh, to the hardware, and instructions modifying pointers. So, for example, pointer arithmetic uh, propagates these bounds. If you add a pointer. Uh, if you add uh, a, a fixed value to a pointer, the uh, bounce information is propagated by the hardware. And every time a pointer is dereferenced, you can then check in the uh, memory interface of the hardware if the uh, pointer is still in bounds um, uh, of the uh, bounce communicated initially by the software. And as I said, um, <clears throat> hardbound requires the software to communicate the initial pointer bounce. And for this purpose, we have written a LLVM based compiler pass which inserts a special little function call to communicate the bounds of buffers and pointers to our virtual prototype. And we can see how this works uh, on, in this code here. Um, we create a pointer to a buffer in line 12, and then our compiler pass inserts a custom set bound function call, which communicates the start address and the size of the value pointer to, to our hardware. And every time the pointer is then modified, for example, in, through pointer arithmetic as done in line 13, then the hardware would propagate these bounds. And when the pointer is dereferenced, we can check if it is still within the bounds that were originally communicated by the software. And these uh, set bound uh, function calls are automatically inserted by our compiler pass. So similar to address sanitizer, this entirely uh, works automatically. And we have also employed this uh, for testing Riot software. And for this purpose, we have uh, compiled Riot with this LLVM based compiler pass we have created for hardbound instrumentation. And uh, we have then combined this with our exploration strategies that I've presented earlier. So both with the injection of test inputs through a network interface and with the manual injection of test inputs through a test harness. And uh, as part of these tests, we have found roughly 15 previously unknown bugs in different write modules. So we've tested the URI parser, we have tested AZIMQT, the MQTSN implementation, uh, the Ripple implementation, uh, the Cliff implementation, the DHCP implementation. And we also found like several bugs along the way. Um, and since our error model focuses on spatial safety violations, the majority of bugs that we have found are indeed uh, spatial memory safety violations in these modules, uh, which is of course somewhat critical because um, some of them may be exploitable, especially if the buffer is, for example, uh, located on the stack. Um, and what you can also see is like some of these modules uh, have a manual unit test suit, like the Cliff module or the URI puzzle module, these have a manual test suit, but unfortunately these sort of bugs that we were managed to uh, discover were missed by, by manual unit testing. And there's also, most of these bugs have been fixed. There's also one bug in uh, Ripple, uh, which remains unfixed. Um, so if anyone is interested in helping with that, I would very much appreciate that. Um, and this brings me to, this, to the conclusion of my talk. I think uh, one interesting uh, key insight here is that um, automated testing can really help complement existing manual unit tests. Like as I saw, as, as I um, illustrated Cliff, the Cliff module, the URI puzzle module, these are modules which already have existing unit tests, but the bugs we found were not discovered through manual unit testing. So I think it really shows that automated testing is something that can really help uh, find bugs in existing code. Um, one other key observation in my view is also that many of the bugs we found partially due to our error model, uh, are um, due to undefined behavior in C, like buffer overflows, spatial safety violations. These are all um, issues which exist because C simply does not uh, define the behavior on uh, a buffer overflow. And the unfortunate thing is, as I motivated in the beginning of my talk, that uh, Riot has relatively few protection mechanisms against the exploitation of these issues. 
So for example, there is a, a stack mesh protection implementation in Riot, but it's not enabled by default and it uses a canary value, which is generated at compile time. And um, since the session is called system uh, improvements, I wanted to briefly suggest a few solutions for these issues. So uh, one interesting direction, uh, which is I think also being explored right now is the use of safer programming languages, which don't have these kinds of issues that C has. Um, like one prominent example of this regard is Rust, which already provides you with spatial memory safety. So you don't have to worry about this particular error class anymore. Uh, another interesting direction is also with the uh, talk we had previously by Hannes uh, from ARM is uh, the employment of additional runtime mitigations. So these new ARM chips, for example, come with uh, all sorts of hardware capabilities, which would allow you to make exploitations of uh, stuff like buffer overflows more difficult by using an MPU, for example, and making the stack non-executable and stuff like that. And I think that's also a very interesting direction, which could be, um, which could be um, explored further as uh, mid to long term, the majority of Riot will probably remain to be written in C. And uh, lastly, a, a very interesting um, direction, which uh, I also illustrated in this talk, I believe is that automated testing can help discover many of these uh, bugs like buffer overflows example. And in my view, it doesn't have to be necessarily symbolic execution. For example, there's also support for primitive fuzzing in Riot already. There's this fuzzing subdirectory, which contains fuzzing applications for I think Gina CTCP and a few other, um, a few other modules and um, making more use of these automated software testing techniques like fuzzing would in my view also help uh, making Riot more secure and finding more of these critical um, bugs uh, very early on. And um, yeah, that's my talk. If you're interested in more information, the source code for ZimXVP is entirely open source and um, available on GitHub. And we have used uh, ZimXVP in our own work as basically a framework for um, researching different uh, software verification problems in the um, embedded domain and has, have used it as the uh, basis for various scientific publications and like the ZimXVP framework itself uh, and the different publications we have um, written based on it are uh, presented in this overview publication um, called ZimXVP, an open source virtual prototype for S agnostic and colleague testing of IoT firmware, which has been uh, published uh, this year in the uh, Journal of System Architecture and which is available as uh, open access. So if you're interested in that, uh, please have a look. Um, that's my talk. Thanks for your attention. And if you have any questions, I will be uh, very happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you, Sören. Um, we have already a first question from the chat from Christian. Um, at Hardware Bound, uh, how does that compare to Cherry or C I H E R E? Yeah, um, thanks for pointing that out. I haven't had the time to look into Cherry in much detail. But the idea is very similar, right? You enforce certain security properties about software like spatial memory safety and hardware. That's what Hardbound does. Long slide. Uh, that's what Hardbound does. And I think that's also the, the idea behind Cherry. But as I said, I haven't had the time to, to look into the details of Cherry yet. So I cannot provide a detailed comparison at this time. But they, they have similar ideas. Okay. Any further questions from Ben? Uh, yeah, thanks for the great work and talk. Uh, just a question about uh, the integration into Riot. Like, if I get ZimXCP, do I need to do anything uh, to to the Riot code base uh, to to use it, or is it is it already self-contained? Uh, can you repeat the question? Like, what do you need to do in Riot in order to employ ZimXCP? Yeah, exactly. What do I need to do to uh, yeah to to make use of this tool in in Riot? So basically with, with this approach where we inject test inputs through a peripheral, you don't need to do anything really in terms of integration effort because the um, application is just simulated in, in a uh, normal hardware environment and it just receives its inputs as normally for the, for the peripheral interface. But you still need to compile right with our hardbound compiler pass, for example, in order to be able to uh, detect spatial violations. And with the other approach I presented, you need to write like these small test harnesses to, to test the individual functions. The majority of integration effort you really need to do is for error detection, like as I presented with this hop bond approach. Yeah. BP make how uh -huh. do I, how do I get this function to write, for example? Yeah, this is a very this is uh, we have a um, we have a custom peripheral as part of our um, ZimXCP, which is called symbolic control, and the symbolic control peripheral allows the software to say something like, "I want ten symbolic bytes." then it returns you 10 symbolic bytes. <laughs> and you need a very like 
50 line 50 line C file in order to communicate with the um, symbolic control peripheral. And that's what um, this VP makes symbolic function does. So that's a very, very low integration effort. So, uh, thank you. Yeah, another question from the chat from Hannes. Uh, have you played with some flick execution on ARM-based MCUs? No. <laughs> so uh, the reason we are using RISC-V for our stuff is because um, you need to modify the um, simulator which executes the RISC-V instructions because our RISC-V instructions can receive uh, symbolic um, values through register operands and through memory. And uh, RISC-V is a very interesting uh, architecture for this kind of uh, stuff because it is very minimal. Like uh, RISC-V is a modular architecture, you have different extensions, and the, the base set, R432E, only has like 40, 40 instructions or so. So it was relatively easy to come up with a symbolic executor for the uh, RISC-V architecture. I think one interesting question in this regard is how can we apply this approach to different architectures, right? Like, like ARM, for example. And in this regard, it would be interesting to me, uh, we haven't done this yet, but this is something we consider for future work to auto-generate our symbolic executor from a functional um, ESA specification. So for example, for RISC-V, a common functional specification is available in the uh, in form of SAIL, which is a functional description of the RISC-V ESA. And the idea would be to automatically generate uh, a symbolic execution backend for RISC-V from this functional specification. And then it would also be possible if there is a SAIL specification for ARM, I believe there is, to automatically generate um, a symbolic execution backend for, for ARM architectures from such a functional specification. And that would make it much easier to, to employ this um, EP-based symbolic execution approach for, for different hardware platforms, not just RISC-V. But our focus is simply on RISC-V because it was very easy to, to uh, implement a prototype for, for this architecture. Are there any more questions from the room? Yes, Simon? Not really a question, more like a comment. Uh, mm -hmm. Are these the techniques you use to find some bugs in GNRC TCP? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, because uh, because if say so, uh, anyway, if you were the guy who did that, uh, I guess I owe you a beer for that. Thank you. And uh, no, the bugs I found in GNRC that was prior work I done as part of my master thesis, and that's uh, that these are bugs that I found through fuzzing. Okay. So before we started exploring um, symbolic execution, I did some work on um, fuzzing write modules as part of my master thesis, and this is where I found uh, a lot of the bugs in the TCP yeah. implementation. Oh, I still owe you a beer. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe after the talk. <laughs> okay, are there any further questions? Uh, there are also no questions from the chat, so I guess we continue with the next talk.